And I'd like to thank the participants who have joined us today in the next session on how to stop muscles from muscling their way in. Same as our walk away from the panel discussion on Tuesday, we hope you walk away from this session with a deeper appreciation of the due diligence and remedies that can be taken to help your hydroelectric facility address aquatic invasive species, particularly quagua, zebra, and mussels. Okay. Zebra, muscle, zebra and quagga mussels decrease plant reliability, heat increase, or heat, I'm sorry. Uh, zebra and quagga mussels decrease plant reliability, heat transfer exchangers, and increase maintenance. Invasive species such as zebra, quagua, and golden mussels have been transferred around the world in ballast waters of the shipping industry. Invasive zebra and quagga mussels arrived in North America in the mid 80s and quickly moved where water flows or transferred. Their proliferation is so fast that they can plug an eight inch pipe within a year. When hydropower facilities are fouled with invasive mussels, power production can be severely hampered. When not controlled, mussels have colonized intake structures, trash racks, penstocks, gates and valves, cooling water systems, fire water protection systems, service and domestic water systems, and even instrumentation, causing unplanned outages and economic penalties. The lost production, high maintenance, have caused hydroelectric community, communities billions of dollars. Invasive mussels were discovered in Colorado River in 2007. As the impact was expected to be significant, Reclamation's Lower Colorado River region of Hoover, Davis, and Parker Dams developed a task force led by Leonard Willett. And Leonard, let me, let me ask you a quick question here. Could you comment on some of the problems and issues and costs faced by reclamation, specifically caused by mussel proliferation? So when the mussels arrived, what ended up happening is the heat exchangers would start to biofoul. Once the heat exchangers biofoul, the control room operators would get a high temp alarm, and the facility managers were concerned that these high temp alarms will cause forced outages. So as anybody in hydro knows, forced outages have huge costs to them. So what Reclamation had to do until they came up with control solutions was to manually clean out the heat exchangers. To manually clean out the heat exchangers, it was labor intensive, roughly $80,000 a year for six heat exchangers, that's man hours and cleaning, putting back in, that had to be repeated as the temperature would go up in the heat exchangers. So the benefit was to eliminate the manual cleaning of the bio valve. Uh, thanks, Leonard. So first on Reclamation's task force list were muscle vulnerability audits to determine who, how, and where are most affected. When it came to solutions, the task force accepted a holistic view on all technologies, both chemical and equipment, to develop cost-effective solutions. With water bodies across Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and California, efficacy and environmental compliance of the ultimate solution were key factors in their process. Over eight years, research pilots and demonstrations were conducted using several chemicals including chlorine, copper, biopesticides, uh, molluscicides, as well as equipment of high flow micron filtration, uh, copper generation, traditional UV, as well as the HOD UV. Throughout the next decade, enormous research was conducted. And, and Leonard, you know, what was involved in, in the muscle vulnerability audits and why, why was it important? So all, of the, all those technologies you listed what the audit does is you go into the power plants with the people with the most knowledge of how they operate, like the maintenance supervisor, the hydroelectric mechanics, the ones that work on the floor every day, they lead the audit. And then the team is made up of, of consultants that have 30 years experience on muscle biofouling and hydro. So, we have the expertise, we don't have the expertise on each system, so we go through and we explain 
um, where the best options are to install control solutions. And then um, we provide a report so they can give that to their management and determine in the budget where's the best place to spend your dollars first, second, and third. Uh, thank you. So, so Leonard, you also, you, your, your team studied many technologies. And I have to admit, I watched one of your presentations before when you talked about it, and I was enamored with it, with your work. Uh, would you comment on some of the pros and cons of the technologies such as chemicals, biopesticides, high flow filtration, and copper generation, if you could? Okay, so chemicals, oxidants do work. The biggest problem with oxidants is, is they're not environmentally friendly. And so most places don't want them in their facility for safety reasons and discharge reasons. So biopesticides like Zequinox is an excellent product for muscle, muscle control, but it's extremely expensive and it does not work for flow through, meaning and you must shut down your cooling water, lock and plug, so all the muscles feed. If you try to use Zequinox with flow through cooling water, it just becomes way too expensive. So um, copper ion generator that you mentioned, um, it does work. The biggest problem that we had when we researched it is we had no control of the copper. And we noticed we had high levels of copper and then we'd have low levels of copper. So we had no control of it. And we were concerned about high levels of sediment, high levels of copper building up in sediment after. So we didn't consider the copper ion generator environmentally friendly. The HOD UV provided um, no discharge permitting required. Um, it was installed right after the strainer and um, it was 100% or 99% effective on muscle settlement. And the operation staff didn't have to do anything. They just looked at the screen. It ran um, years 24-7, 365. Yeah, I like that, Leonard, because I'm, I'm an ex-cooling water guy from uh, NALCO. And in and, and the cooling water industry, you know, he transfers everything. And, and 24-7, 365, you know, the the HOD UV is a continuous solution, where a lot of these other solutions aren't, aren't necessarily continuous. They're only um, end of season or spot type of treatment. So having something 24-7 and keeping those heat exchangers clean I, is, is valued. So following all the detailed evaluations of chemical and non-chemical technologies, Reclamation selected the hydro-optic UV technology as the preferred treatment solution at Hoover, Davis, and Parker Dams. Further, Reclamation contracted all services, all parts, including lamps and extended warranty that kept the HODUV systems online and operating for five years. And, and Leonard, let me ask you this question. You know, Reclamation entered into a five-year service contract with Atlantium. Why did Reclamation decide to go that direction? So one of the things HOD um, offered reclamation was um, a solution for biobelly. Number one, that was it, a solution. We no longer had to deal with what is not our core mission, which was the water delivery and power, not quagga muscles. So it offered a solution. Now, why we did a turnkey maintenance agreement was Atlantium offered a five-year warranty and they took care of the system. It was a one source, one stop shop. So Reclamation decided they would just use the maintenance agreement, have the extended warranty, and the extended warranty just basically covered all parts of service. If we got an alarm, we called the Atlantean technician, which arrived within 48 hours. Um, if he could arrive sooner if needed, and it's worked great. And we, Reclamation, I have left Reclamation now, but Reclamation extended that contract and then additional five years. So if it was not working, um, that would not have happened. You know, interesting thing, I'll, I'll add one more point to that. You know, I think with the, by extending the contract, um, one thing that the service people at Atlantic, they work on these systems all the time. And when you look at an end user, the end user, these systems are pretty robust they work by themselves and they and the end user works on them so infrequently that a lot of times they forget how to do things. 
This way, by having someone else be responsible for it that continually works on it, they come in and, and take care of everything, everything in a much shorter time frame. Whereas the own, uh, their own, the end user or the hydroelectric facility who's not used to may, maybe maintaining these things, maybe doing it once a quarter or once every six months, they forget. They don't really learn how to how quickly to do it, and it takes a lot longer. But good, good insight. So the hydro-optic UV technology was selected by reclamation for Parker, Davis, and Hoover Dam. The HODUV was a non-chemical, environmentally friendly solution that required no permitting by the local regulatory agencies. The core of the technology is a proprietary science that recycles and concentrates energy from a medium pressure UV within a total internal reflection chamber. When combined with a comprehensive monitoring of the critical parameters of flow, UV intensity, and UV transmittance, the technology will dose pace as water conditions change. Thus, the HODUV offers the strongest efficacy at a lower energy usage. Finally, the equipment was easy to install as the equipment was compact with flange to flange piping configuration. Now, prior to the HODUV, the heat exchangers were mechanically cleaned on a yearly basis. After implementation of the HODUV, the dams eliminated their yearly cleaning and achieved muscle independence. And Leonard, what do you feel was valued by reclamation in selecting the HODUV? Well, it was a it was a turnkey install. We we installed it at Hoover, Davis, and Parker dams on the Lower Colorado River. Each install was installed by a different contractor. So that tells you that it isn't, it's very simple to install in your piping system. So we installed it in the cooling water system right after the strainer at Hoover and Davis and Parker. What was the advantages is no longer were the heat exchangers biofouling and overheat. Thanks, Leonard. So Reclamation installed the HODUV at Parker, Davis, and Hoover Dam. Combined with a comprehensive service program with these dams achieved muscle independence. Leonard, with your experience, where in the system and how did you install the HODUV? So normally what, what we did at Reclamation is we would just write a contract and the contract would include the Atlantium HOD because of our research study and validation. And the contractor would just simply install it. Um, when it was done, um, Atlantium would come in um, and commission the system. And from then on, they took care of it. And um, our muscle problems went away. And um, that's, that's how we did it. Each okay. contract was a little different, but um, so it just depends on how your procurement is set up. Okay, well, so as the mussels overtook the river, you know, they got in the Colorado River and they proliferated pretty fast. They started filtering the water. And um, what other problems were created by the increase in water clarity? So at every one of our sites, as the mussels um, been there, as mussels arrive and they're there for two to three years, they do clear up the water because of their filter feeding mechanism. As the water clears up, then you have other problems that have arrived at each one of our dams. And those other problems are um, blue-green algae, taste and odor, um, colonial hydroid, bryozoas, and weed problems due to the clarity of the water, sunlight penetrating to the bottom of the reservoir, breaking off and plugging everything. These end up actually being a bigger problem than the mussels, but originally they're not there. So when you install a system, you want to make sure that you at least have the capability to size or expand for these other invasives like colonial hydrides and bryozoas. The weeds can be handled by trash rakes and strainers, but the invasives, you need to make sure you keep in the back an expansion or an increased system, larger system. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I'd like to add a little bit to, to that too. You know, the, the HODUV is you know, similar to Legos. Uh, the HODUV is easily expandable at a future date. So um, you can start off with maybe just controlling muscles as, as they did down in Parker Dam. But as the slime and these uh, colonial hydroids arrived, um, the, the, the thing that worked there is they still had some capacity where they could increase the energy and able to take care of the colonial hydroids, the, the slime essentially. But in cases where more complex organisms may come along, maybe bryozoa, and you need a, high, a higher, more energy, you know, the HOD UV, UV can be expanded to increase that energy um, at a later date. And so what I, a suggestion may be when installing the HOD UV in the carbon steel pipe, uh, put carbon steel spool pieces before and after the HOD UV. So maybe three years, five years, seven years down the road, you can easily take out one of those carbon spool pieces and put in, uh, expand it with an additional HODUV sections and lamp sections to increase the energy at a future date. So in Canada, so in Canada, Ontario Power Generation validated success in water with UV transmittance as low as 40%. In Reclamation's research, they found that the HODUV had unique efficiencies that could achieve higher efficacy. Based on their work, Reclamation's Science and Technology Program selected this research as their project of the year. Further, Power Magazine awarded Reclamation their 2019 Water Award. In addition, EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, awarded the Southern Company's Plan Bowen their Technology Award based on their research and discoveries using the HODUV. And, and Leonard, uh, I know you and your predecessors uh, should uh, embellish in that award. That was quite, quite a bit, because you guys also had quite a bit of discoveries um, in your research when using the HODUV. So if you could, you know, after our session, please feel free to reach out to Leonard or myself if you have any additional questions or wish more information. And now I guess we'll open up the floor to any other questions that may be out there to, to answer by, by the group. Dennis, we do have one question that came in for you. I just know we're going to cut off. Uh, so one quick question. Given the new and upcoming, all these, uh, the pathogens, the viruses, the threats in the waterways, is there a role for the HOD UV in other markets such as conservation hatcheries and power stations? I'm just wondering if people listening today might, you know, because of the closely tied ecosystems. Yeah, good point. So HOD UV is heavily used in aquaculture industry. And one of the key things is the efficacy. You can get down to four log removal of the IPN virus. Uh, the IPN virus is a sig extremely significant uh, harmful effects to fish. It can knock out 30, 40, 50 percent of the fish's crop. Um, in this case, even now, as they do transfer water, you don't want to transfer the uh, pathogens, the viruses, or more importantly, you don't want to transfer invasive species. And the HODUV is a perfect uh, technology that could get extremely um, uh, more for log removal of the uh, pathogens or the invasive species. Well, so we may have run out Dennis. of time. Yeah, we're okay. out of time. So again, thank you for that. And everyone, look, uh, please reach out to Dennis and Leonard following this session to get some more information. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.